Welcome back to the Career Dad Show, and I am here with Chris Salem. Chris, how are you? Dan, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. No, thank you so much. Thank you for making the time. I do really appreciate people are taking time out of their day just to entertain me and the listeners. So that's great. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. No, thank you. Um, so we got introduced, uh, another introduction from Eric Swanson, who we were just saying is probably one of the most energetic people that definitely I've ever come across. I don't know about yourself. He is, he is very energetic and he's just a, a, just a great guy, just a yeah. great connector of people. And, you know, they, they don't, you know, they call him Mr. Awesome for a reason. So yeah. cause he, he just, he just, everything he does is awesome. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And um, so um, there's kind of two stories that I want to, I want to talk to you about because, uh, you know, your, your life today um, you do motivational speaking and you're on that speak circuit and you also run a non-profit which is very very close to, to my heart um, you know the the EFA movement which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into but before all of that you know you had quote a corporate gig right so you worked in sales across a whole span so let, c can we start there talk to us about that sales role yeah I uh, well I spent I graduated in in at the end of 1989. So I started my career uh, at 20, around 23 years old in uh, January of 1990. So I spent a majority of my career in sales. So working for companies, representing companies. And I, you know, I enjoyed it. I was a, definitely a people person. Uh, I had a, a great work ethic and I was, I had a lot of energy in terms of doing what it takes for a salesperson to kind of you understand, you know, the life, the lifestyle of a salesperson, you know, you got the ups and downs yeah, and, sure. but nonetheless, I would say that it wasn't always an easy ride personally, I would say in the, for like a good seven years when I started my career at 23 and then till I was 30, I was struggling personally, even though I, I could put the mask on, like everything was going great, uh, when I was selling and in the, you know, in the work world, but Meanwhile, things weren't as great when it came to me, what was happening personally. And and if, if you don't mind me asking that, how, how, how do you mean? Like, do you, you... Yeah, I would say for me is that I was struggling at the time with uh, who I was, you right. know, was I really living my values or somebody else's? Uh, I was, I, I kind of lived in this world where I needed everything to be validated. Yeah. Uh, where I couldn't make my own decisions and I really put a lot of uh, high expectations onto others. And right. this kind of kind of played out in how I transformed after I was 30 into a lot of things I do today, which I'm happy to talk about. Yeah, that's that's interesting because I I I've really struggled in the past with internal validation and external validation and being yeah heavily skewed towards external validation so whether it be growing up as a teenager and that being in girls or getting into the workforce and having you know if your boss didn't pat you on the back and say hey dan good job i just would crumble i wouldn't be able to cope without that external um and, and was that kind of similar for for you and i guess the similar, world that you're yeah. in yeah for me dan it was that i you know even while i i projected you know one that really had his act together and yeah had a high level of self-esteem and confidence it was directly the contrary it was i really was operating from a place of low self-esteem and self-confidence and a lot of it had to do growing up where i didn't really have that connection that every boy desires to have with his father yeah and because of that you know i kind of grew up really with no direction kind of lost and trying to seek the answers really outside of myself, not knowing who I really was. So I, I began to pick up certain things about maybe other people that I admired and tried to become, you know, the, the, you know, those people or, or, or own their roles and ended up being uh, quite miserable and, and acting out in anger, you know, most of my early adulthood. Do you know, it's, it's honestly like, like looking in a mirror. It's like talk, talking to, to someone that's lived my experience. Cause exactly, you know, I, I ended up having therapy last year, which was one of the best things that I ever did. But what that kind of uncovered is the, you know, my parents divorced when I was quite young and I didn't have that kind of father figure I'd have wanted. So I put that father figure onto institutions, 
onto onto uh, senior particularly senior male execs who kind of took me under their wing and i couldn't differentiate between you know if one of those people then made a decision that didn't ethically or morally sit well on my compass i didn't know how to deal with that because i'd put these unhealthy emotional attachments onto people who didn't ask for it and it was just my insecurities that was playing out is is that kind of resonate yeah, same thing with me. It was very, very similar. And it was just, again, you know, living in this world of expectations that went unfulfilled and just experiencing it through anger and more anger and escaping from it, you know. So I, you know, I got involved in certain things to escape the pain and, mm. you know, bouts with drugs, alcohol, sexual addiction as ways to escape. But yet, I'm so grateful today, well, even 20 years, 20 plus years ago that I went through that yeah. because I wouldn't be the dad and I wouldn't be the husband and I wouldn't be the, uh, the, the influencer or role model that I am today had I not experienced that to now experience what's better for me and to be that example for others. Yeah, and 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 the last question, kind of on the kind of past, because I don't want to dwell on the past. I want to look at. I want to look at the future and, and the now. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, a lot of what drives me and to be the father that I want to be to my kids is kind of what I had lacking. It's like you know when you when you start work and you kind of you go from that first role into a managerial role and you go, oh, I've never been a manager. I don't know what to do. And someone says, well, if you've ever, if you've ever had a bad manager, just do all the things that are the opposite of what they did. And like I kind of apply apply some of the parenting to that as as well. And and do you think that that's driven? Because you've got is it is it one son you have? I have one son. Yeah, my my we my wife and I just had uh, you know numerous miscarriages and in, in vitros Sorry. that did not uh, obviously work. But I was blessed to have my son. So yes. And and so I'm first sorry to hear that but yeah. great that you've got your your boy absolutely so so grateful and so thankful and and do you and to your point have the experiences that you had throughout childhood throughout your early career really solidified the kind of dad that now you want to be yeah i mean i'm, I'm exactly the father that i desire to be it's like i became the dad that i always as a boy wanted to have yeah and so now I had to kind of become that dad so that I can, you know, my son would have a, a more, you know, a, a, a healthier environment in, in an interdependent versus a codependent way yeah. to grow up, to become a better leader in his future home, his community and his uh, career or business. Whereas then I was able to also give peace to myself and knowing that I could, you know, heal that inner child. And knowing I can release that and let go and forgive my father and forgive any of the experiences that I have that I felt wronged me, mm. knowing that they were all part of the process to really right. mold me who I am today and to not only be a good father and a good husband, but to be, again, an example for other dads that they could go take care of themselves, get to the root cause of their own limited beliefs and become better examples for their children and their wives and so on yeah that's that's just beautiful isn't it really <laughs> i didn't know the word for it and, um how, how old's your son now he is uh going on 13 he's 12 wow. but he'll be 13 at the end of november he just started uh eighth grade yesterday yeah. was his first day now it was virtual okay but they're doing a hybrid uh he, he go he's uh virtual to, uh, yesterday and today and then tomorrow and friday he'll be in class okay how's he finding it he's doing okay he's adapted very well virtually awesome. again when he was in class he's a he's a straight a student uh athlete and uh very blessed that you know that you know the, the know that he's my son and i yeah. really enjoy the you know the, the the time that we've have together and coached his sports and, and to this day now I'm more of a spectator <laughs> but I'm I'm at every game and involved in a lot of his activities. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. And one thing that I because my my son he's six, right? And so I 
I'm kind of conscious that I grew up in this. My dad wasn't around as much as I wanted to be. So therefore, I'm going to try and give my son as much of me as I can. And I'm kind of conscious that if you fast forward 10, 15, 20 years, that he's going to be like, Dad, you were never not there. I never had time <laughs> to just go wild and do all these things. And I'm just wondering how does, you know, your son's a little bit further on that journey. How how has he found, I mean, he's not known any different, right? But how has he found the relationship that you guys have? I think he's really learned a lot. I mean, he, he understands that I respect his privacy, especially now that he's going and getting to that age where like, you know, mom and dad, uh, okay, I got, I'm doing my own thing, you know, yeah. that type of thing. But he respects that I really, that I, you know, I've taught him how to take responsibility earlier rather than later in life. Those are mm. key interdependent behaviors and characteristics that you want to instill in your children as they become adults so they don't become codependent and then that codependency just becomes toxic over time in any relationship. So I really respect, I have his boundaries, his privacy. He understands if he makes a decision that's not right, well, okay, there's a consequence. So we deal with it and you learn and you move forward. Mm. But I'm not trying to micromanage him. I'm not trying to make his decisions. I'm just, again, that he is mindful of his own decisions, but being respectful of the rules of what he does in the home where he lives and so on. So it's yeah. uh, it's exciting to see how he's developing and you're starting to see some of these uh, these skills start to play out in other little areas of his life, you know, like leadership and all that yeah. type of stuff. That's really cool. That's really cool. And has has he has he tried to do something or wanted to do something that you're not happy with and kind of if so how how have you dealt with that? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, while he's a great student, you know, and he d does well in his studies, he completes his projects, you know, mm. he's uh, he likes gaming. So I wouldn't <laughs> say that he's on these games eight hours a day, but yeah. he's really, he likes to, you know, the Fortnite and the, the, the whole gaming thing. And he's got really, really good at it Yeah. to a point where he actually could, you know, had an opportunity to make some money from it. Now, wow. his mother wasn't too happy about it, but yet... I looked at it more for like, you never question an entrepreneur, meaning that, you know, if that is something in him, he's looking at it as a way to generate income, something he li likes to do, mm. and perhaps he's adding value to whoever can benefit from that. Now, am I a gamer? No, I'm, the, I'm actually the direct, I don't like video games, I never liked them. So we, we can't see eye to eye to that, but I yeah. can respect his decision that he's looking at it in a way that that's getting his creative juices flowing. He's getting better at something and that he could generate some income from it if that's what he chooses to. Yeah. But knowing that he understands that he has other responsibilities, his homework, yes. his chores, he plays sports that he, you know, he doesn't miss practices. Hmm. He commits to what he, he agreed to do. So as long as he, that's happening, I, I'm not going to, you know, discourage him, even though I'm not really, a big gamer and I don't really support it a hundred percent, but not yeah. I support him yes. in what's important to him. Yeah. I, I really respect that because that, the, the, so I'm a big gamer. I, and I have yeah. been since I was a kid, you know, a lot of my <laughs> tattoos are gaming tattoos. Are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so my, again, my son, when he, he played Xbox with me when he was little, we now have a switch and we play that together. And, you know, he's, he's getting quite good, which is straight, you know, I, six years old he's not on Fortnite, um but you know and and when to kind of flip it on its head a little bit he also he, he uh, obviously does his school work but he also plays drums and when uh, i do a lot of uh, vlogging and you know youtube tiktok linkedin and stuff and he's he's aware of that so when he started doing the drums he said to me he was at five and he was like daddy i want to start a youtube channel to kind of show you know my drumming so it could or he hears me talk about document documenting a lot it's like i want to document my drumming and i'm like man this is i don't know how i feel about this because on the one hand that's awesome on the other hand am i subliminally you know uh exploiting my child like this exploiting your child yeah you yeah. don't want the you know, pedophiles yeah and I, we had to deal with that with my son on tiktok right. and and some other things just making sure that you know, he's not, you know, you know, engaging in conversations with suspect people. And yeah, but at the same token, you know, again, your son's a lot younger. So there might be some more, you know, you have to really look at certain things. But, you know, yeah. again, exercising some 
some, um, uh, you know, more responsibility and some more, you know, where he can make, you know, try to empower him to make certain decisions. Yes. And just knowing, you know, again, just keeping an eye here and there to make sure he's not doing anything that can expose him in an unhealthy way. And I, th I, th I think that's really important. And something that, that I'm quite big on is I don't like to just say no because dad says so. I, I like to have age appropriate conversations, but to say, look, there are some people online that aren't nice people. We don't need to go into why they're not nice people, but they're not nice people. Yes. So it's the same with his Nintendo. We say, look, if someone sends you a friend request, if you don't know them, don't accept it. That's probably the best thing. And he kind of, it's it's only a little thing, but it's empowering him to make that choice. And he knows that he can have a conversation with me or his mum, uh, you know, if he wants to question that, which I hope, I just think if you put hard bands on stuff, whether it be chocolate or fizzy drinks or whatever it is, I think that later in life that could then become a problem, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Something that you said, and you've mentioned a few times, and I really wanted to talk to you about, was codependent versus interdependent. Because I've yes. heard you talk about this before. Yeah. Could, could you could you explain what you mean? Yeah. So you know what codependency is is that when we either one we depend upon someone else for certain things that we perhaps can do ourselves, right? Or we are the person that will enable the codependent, meaning that we're doing things to please them. Right. But thinking that we're doing for them, but really we're getting something in return. We're feeling that if we please them or do enough for them, they'll recognize me. They'll validate me. They'll respect me. They'll love me more. And then when that goes unfulfilled again, because that's an expectation for the giver, the pleaser, that leads to then disappointment and mm. then repeating the cycle and to, it gets to a point where it becomes exhausting, uh, tiresome, uh, it becomes uh, toxic at some point. So that's codependent behavior, it, you know, how it plays out in communication and relationships in general. Interdependency says instead of going to do for someone or please someone, we're leading by example. We are being the example for others to observe and do for themselves. It doesn't mean that you can't help somebody out and do, you know, like, Maybe to, you know to help your grandmother get out of the chair, yeah. something like that. But but it's 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 empowering people to take responsibility for their roles and their duties to learn how to grow through challenges, and that you're being the example. So that's a that's a form of interdependent behavior, which then is more empowering. It's more sustainable. It's got more longevity. Is it easy to do up front? No, but as you get into the rhythm over time, it's that type of behavior and communication that leads to healthier relationships in the family, in the communities, and in business overall. Yeah, that's really interesting. And and thinking about the codependency, as you as you're explaining it, I'm almost visualing like a, a hurricane and and going down into the, the the bottom of the spiral of just you know you. you you mentioned expectation a number of times. How how damaging can expectation be? And should we try yeah. to just have no expectation of anyone? Yeah, yeah. And I know that some people are going to sit there and be doing this, scratching their head. What, what yeah. do you mean, no expectations? Well, it's all, we, we could all have desired results, right? So these are the results that we see. And those results are going to be in a certain time that you've designated in the future. Hmm. But instead of getting attached to the outcome, which then is tied to expectations, it's going to be a, you're going to go through that time where you might get caught up in the things you can't control. Yeah. You're going to be worried. You're going to have anxiety. You're going to stress. You're going to be overwhelmed. Instead, have the results that you see. You know they're there, but come into the moment. So instead of operating in the past and the future with a fixed mindset, a growth mindset recognizes that I'm going to be present. I have a plan that's going to take me from where I'm at now to my goals. I don't know everything. I don't have all the information or all the things that are going to be necessary yet. But this is what I do know and what I what I can do. And I'm going to just do that today, trusting the process each day, each week, each month, each quarter, each year will will present new puzzle pieces that I can connect over time that will lead to the result. So it's shifting your thinking from the expectation to the outcome to yeah. now 
in the, doing what you can in the moment, trusting the process, letting go of what you can, and letting that each day, each week, each month, each year lead to the results that you see. Hmm. That will relieve a lot of the stress, the worry, the anxiety, and keep that energy in a more positive light to be focused on what you're doing right here and now, not something you haven't done yet, or you know, you're, you're assuming or speculating could happen. You're, so it eliminates that need to speculate and assume, eliminates the, you know, the be rely upon expectations, and it's just trusting the process, doing your part and letting go of the rest. That's where the magic happens. So interesting to get your thoughts on this. Based on what you've just said, how important do you think it is to be able to change your mind? It's uh, it, it is a process. So everything I'm talking about, you know, it, you know, sounds like, oh, my God, that's wonderful. But in but in reality, it's not easy because we, yeah. we we've been conditioned as humans growing up to do the direct opposite. Yeah. So it's like you're, you're asking yourself to undo all these things you've been doing these years and now do it this way. It It's again, people do what they do on autopilot. So for yeah. for this to become a new autopilot, you have to do it every day over a certain period of time before it becomes a pattern. So this is where discipline will become your best friend and consistency is the action to make it happen. So discipline and consistency together means that you're doing things that you normally would not do on autopilot. You may not even want to do them, hmm. but you're doing them because you know that it's going to lead to better communication, yeah. it's going to improve your well-being, it's going to build your success foundation, it's going to improve your relationships with others. And as you keep doing it through the discipline and, and consistency over time, now it starts to become a new pattern on autopilot over time. But that doesn't happen right away. This is like when people start diets and they go on a diet to lose weight for, yeah. and they, they want to go to their daughter or son's wedding. They're motivated by that one event to lose the weight, but once that happens, they go right back to the same old behaviors yes. and the weight comes back on and nothing has really changed. It was short lived. This is a lifestyle change. This is a, yeah. that's something you're not doing once in a while or, or you know, a couple of days a week. You, this is a decision that you have to do this through discipline and, and consistency every day and it becomes part of your life forever. Yeah, I'm so glad you went there with, with the dieting because I was thinking you can apply this to anything, right? It's like, if yes. I want to learn French, what do I do? Well, you practice 30 minutes a day every day. You know, if you yep. want to lose weight, what do you do? You want to learn the drums, what do you do? And it's and it's the same with, um, you know, our careers, right? Because I think something that, that I've often struggled with when I've had kind of development conversations with uh, my bosses is they say, where, where, where do you want to be in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years? And I go, I don't know. Like, I like I like what I'm doing now. I, I know what challenges that I want to take on in the future and what kind of responsibilities I want, but I can't give you a job title because I don't have that information yet. I'm going to gain that information from going on that journey. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, going back to that that sales career that you had and and particularly doing what you're doing now was this always in the back of your mind as a as a goal yeah i would say that you know when i went through this major transformation in my life dan back in you know 21 plus i think it, well yeah it's uh it's been 1999 so yeah so my dad it, it, this all happened when my dad died at the age of 56 of cancer that was really the pivoty pivot moment when I went through this, mm. it, it was always something that I knew that I was already doing. And then I said, at some point, I'm going to be teaching this, you know, it, it not, you know, or, cause I was already a professional speaker, but I, and when I ended up migrating out of sales into executive coaching and into training companies, I said to myself that this is something, these core values that represent me, transparency, honesty, integrity, everything that we talked about, I can incorporate these principles in just about anything, business related, uh, family related, or you know, people in general. So it could be both personal development, professional development, business development, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You can incorporate these, these principles into any of these things that apply to communication, leadership, uh, you know, innovation, whatever, marketing, brand strategy. So I, I, when I'm working with people, either individuals or businesses or families, 
I can then adapt a lot of these things to that situation because the principles are all the same. It doesn't yeah. matter if it's personal or if it's business, they're the same. To me, life and business are one. Whatever happens in your personal life affects your business. Whatever happens in your business affects your personal life. So this is why it's so critical for dads that this isn't you know a switch that we turn on when we're at work and then we come home and we let our guard down. This is something that it's gotta be transparent and, and authentic and consistent 24 seven, who you are behind closed doors is who you are to the public each and every day. Yeah, and I think this is why it sucks. I want to now come on to the EFA movement and talk about that because I think this is why it's so important with the work that you're doing because from my point of view, at least, society historically has said, no, dad, you put on this face, you go to work, you do your work and you know you kind of bottle up any insecurities, you don't talk about your emotions, you don't you know, keep work and life very, very separate, which never sat well with me and I guess has ended up doing what I'm doing now. But let's talk about you and, and let's talk about the EFA movement. So what's that? So EFA movement stands for Empowered Fathers in Action. So EFA is the acronym and movement is that this is a movement, meaning that yeah. this isn't, uh, a, a, you know, we're gonna put a Band-Aid on something or we're gonna manage the problem or manage resources. We're looking for to provide sustainable solution to change someone's life, to be the example for their children to do the same when they have their children, to break the dysfunction of codependency and create an interdependent family structure versus a codependent one, which leads to, again, better leaders in, in our, you know, when our children become adults in their homes, their communities, and their business. So for us, it's all about teaching you know, you know, families, in this case with the dad, the impact of limited beliefs and how that can not only impact their own lives in a negative way, but also how that gets passed along to their own mm -hmm. children. I picked up these limited beliefs from both my mom and dad, but more in this case from my father that really had more of an influence over me in a negative way. We get, pro, we, we get positive and negative things that we get from our parents. So with that being said, you know, EFA is all about you know, providing solutions there, but we know that a movement isn't just one source. It requires us to lock arms with many different sources that really see the vision of a more an abundant, prosperous world, one where we're coming together, not opposing one another, and really living our lives coming together based upon core values. Doesn't mean we have to have the same values, but we can we can understand and relate one another. So all these principles are part of the EFA movement and all the alliance partners that we we work with and want to continue to keep working with. So we could start making these changes over time through example worldwide, because one source in itself, you know, won't be able to do that. We, we got to all come together. So that's why it's called EFA movement. I love it. I love it. And, and, and how, so uh, a dad who, who joins the, yeah, he joins a, is there their, their courses? Is that is that how it works? Yeah, we, we do provide. Well, we have a couple of different things. We we do provide a a, court, a, a a program which could help you know the fathers to overcome their own limited beliefs, learn how to become better leaders in their homes, in their workplaces, how to lead by example, how to communicate more effectively, uh, all of those things. So we have programs that are geared towards individuals, families, businesses. And then we also have facilitator programs where you, you know, where you go through this to actually experience it for your own self. And then we can go through a program where can, now you can become a certified facilitator of the EFA movement process or the methodology that we teach so that now you can go teach this in your community, your churches, your schools or businesses. And then you have a resource through us and our partnering organizations that we could help you in, in, in making that happen. So you have some somebody to lean on and so on. So it's a great way to give back to the community. Yeah. And there's ways that you can generate revenue because people will, will pay for those services. So so it's it's a win-win. So that's kind of like how we were set up right now currently. Yeah. And what, what does an average uh, EFA dad look like? What what or is it a range? There, there could be a range. I mean, an EFA dad is someone that has really learned how to, to, you know, become, look at vulnerability and transparency as a strength versus a weakness. Wow. Willing to look at, is, is he really operating from his true values or somebody else's or what he's been led to believe? Yeah. That he understands what his strengths and weaknesses are and knows that 
He's never going to be everything for everyone and, and recognizes that mistakes and failures are part of the process to build success and whatever that means to you personally and your, your business. So it, it's someone that embraces the process to go out and achieve the results they desire to seek, but doing it in the moment, trusting the process, you know, from a place of limitless beliefs versus limited beliefs. So that's what a EA, EFA dad would look like, you know, you know, going through this methodology and in in these programs. And then once they get into a rhythm, be, you know, begin to kind of experience that and then become, you know, an example for others to do the same for themselves. Wow. Because I, I, I almost had this image of my head that it was almost like a, a referral program potentially is in like, you know, there, there might be, uh, say, uh, dads from, you know, uh, underprivileged backgrounds and it might be, you know, yeah, trying to break the cycles. But what you're and that might be a part of it. But what you're talking around there is almost like these super enlightened dads who are like, do you know what? I, I'm probably doing OK, but I, I know I could do better and let me make do positive. Better. And change. then again, yeah. you know, they, they have friends, they have families and they mm. see their behavior change. They see their community. What are you doing? What what happened to you? How, you're just so much easier to get along with or you have you have better boundaries than you did before. You yeah. you know, I respect you more. What are you, what are you doing different? Well, I learned some of these things from EFA. Well, what is EFA? You know, so. So it's not really that we're looking for the recognition or the you know the credit you know the credit for somebody making a change. We don't really care about that. As a matter of mm -hmm. fact, we don't even care where where they got it from. They could have got it through somebody that we partnered with. It doesn't yeah. matter as long as that that what is being provided to them that they're doing something with it to make the changes. That's all that we yeah. really care about. It's about you know that that there's proof in that they're changing and then they're starting to see an improvement in their businesses, their personal lives, their relationships, their roles as a dad, a husband, mm. and and that they're understanding that life is gonna always have the good and the bad, but yeah. not looking at it the, when it's bad, that it's bad. Looking at when it's bad as part of the process that, that, that I'm learning something and there's opportunities and blessings disguised in those challenges because I'm gonna become more as I go through this. Yeah, those that's an empowered dad, a powered father, an enlightened father, thinking from a growth versus a fixed mindset. I I, th I think that's that's really profound because something that I've always tried to to look at is no matter what situation that I've gone through, however bad it is, at some point in the future I'll be able to take something from it, whether it be a learning. You know, I I I wrote off my car when I was eighteen, which was not a good experience, but that probably the reason that happened was from I was doing some pretty self-destructive things and probably that was a wake-up call to not go too far and potentially end up in jail or do you know so <laughs> probably that was a positive thing even though at the time at 18 you think it's the end of your life and your parents <laughs> probably help with making you feel like that um but yeah do, do you do you think that especially given some of the things that you've been through, would you change any of it, any of the really bad stuff because it's led to where you are now? I, I think as I look back now, Dan, I mean, I, I'm, I am thankful and blessed that I went through these trials and tribulations because again, like with anything, gratitude it means that you're grateful for what you have in the moment. Mm. But a lot of times that you, you experience that really, that gratefulness now, you can really feel it at the core level. It's because you know you've been on the opposite side when things were really going south or really you were in a bad situation. And yet it's in those situations when you're falling apart that you're, you know, you're about to come back together in a better way. Yeah. It's again part of the process. It's like whatever, you know, when things build up and then they come crumbling down and then they build back up, you know, it's it's like the evolution of life. And that, and yeah. that's kind of like how we approach it that if we're going to create something better and something new you've got to break down the old you can't you can't mask the old you know you could but that to me that's like managing the problem you yes. know and and as a society we live in a society of managing problems we're not solving problems and the only way you're going to solve a problem is that you have to play a part in it or if it's your problem you can only solve it nobody can solve a problem for you they could they could be there as a guide support Maybe there might be something that can help aid to help solve it. But in itself, when it comes down to it, it's always our responsibility as people to solve our own problems and as a team 
to play a part in doing our part to do that as a whole. Yeah. It's, it, I really like what you're saying around breaking things, you know, breaking yourself down to build it back up. It's, it's like weight training, right? It's like muscle, muscle tissue. You have to break down that muscle tissue and it'll come back stronger. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, what, one last thing on, on EFA is, and you, and you mentioned this, you were saying that, uh, you know, it's great to be able to impact the communities, but also it can be a revenue stream because people are willing to, to either companies or willing Oh, to yeah, pay. yeah. I mean, you could do trainings like this for, for EAP programs, employee yeah. assistance programs, for companies, for community organizations, churches, schools, yeah. charter schools, public schools, private schools. I mean, just about, again, this, this is a methodology that can be applied to any life or business situation. It yeah. impacts and your well-being. It re impacts your, your relationships, your communication, your uh, ability to execute on things that are going to help build you financially. So, um, you know, but it starts with your well-being. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are eight pillars of wellness that people don't usually address. There's Social wellness, that's the relationship with yourself and other people. Again, are you codependent or interdependent? Or you could be independent uh, in the middle. It's your emotional well-being, free from limited beliefs or you're, you're stuck in limited beliefs. Then there's physical wellness. That's how you take care of your outer shell. Are you taking care, are you exercising, are you eating better? Or you're not taking, doing any of that. Financial wellness, your dialogue with money, your dialogue with wealth in general. Uh, there's uh, a spiritual wellness, meaning that it's not meaning just what you believe in, whoever your religion is. It's a belief in yourself and your your higher your higher power, whoever that may be. It's a it's a process. That's what I like to call the process. It's not any particular religion. It's not just the universe. It's not just it's it's you and the entity that you choose as your process. Uh, occupational wellness. Are you doing what you love to do and why you do what you do from those core values and, and leveraging your strengths? Uh, uh, there's uh, intellectual wellness. Are we stimulating our mindsets? Are we reading more, doing trivia, puzzles, things that stimulate the mind to be more creative and innovative versus spending five, six hours a day you know, in front of the television set mm. where we're really disengaging our minds from getting better? And then environmental wellness is simply, you know, your environment. You know, is it one of clutter or is it one of organization? Where you work, your car, your home. So it's making sure that you, when you have better organization, you can now be more, you have more clarity. It helps to become more decisive, to take action. It creates more positive energy. So this is how the eight pillars work. And when they're in alignment, you can find more harmony there. Whereas if, if, if one of them's not doing well, well, it's going to impact the others yeah. like a domino, dominoes do. So it's kind of like we address a lot of those areas in terms of really helping people to really be in more control of their lives and their, and their careers and really learning those principles to really improve the quality of their lives. Yeah. That's great. And, and I think um, I think if anyone kind of wants to find out more about that, I think if people Google like a wellness wheel, I seem to remember doing a wellness wheel once with a career coach who kind of got me to plot where I would put myself in each one of those things you describe. And it was quite interesting and start yeah. to see where I was coming up short. Um, and yeah, you know, based on what you've just said, I think it's just super impressive that you're running this as a nonprofit because it could be very, very easy to run it not as a nonprofit. No, absolutely. I mean, and some of the partner companies that we're with are not all nonprofits. Some of them, are, they're, they're, you know, incorporated and, you know, so they are for profit. But again, it's just, again, we are, we are the place that actually can, you know, that has the process and the methodology. Hmm. And we have the capability of teaching people to do this for themselves to bring in their communities and they can do it for profit or non-profit, whatever they choose. And of course, you know, you can make money doing that, especially yeah. if it's for a, a, a for profit business. Yeah, for sure. So before I go on to the last question, I just wanted to ask you, with your son, what are, what are the hopes that you have for your son that may be different from, from your kind of experience? What are your hopes for him? Well, I mean, every father would love to see their, their kid become like, you know, a great athlete, you know, and 
my son is, uh, you know, a decent athlete. He, he plays, a, you know, does very well. But he, will he become a pro? Probably not. Um, but that's okay. He, he's learning the leadership skills. He's learning the, you know, all the things that are going to be ne- that you learn in when you're playing team sports mm. that, that you can bring into the real world when it comes to business, when it comes to working with others, forging quality relationships with a future family one day. See, these are things that my dad never learned. He never received it. And then he yeah. passed it on to me. And that's why I was so dysfunctional. Had I got married at, at a younger age, like that, I would have one been divorced and I would have probably had a couple kids that would have been screwed up because mm. I was screwed up. So, yeah. so I'm very blessed that all of those things took place after I got my, my act again, <laughs> so to speak. And, but, but yeah, these are things that I, I strongly believe that, you know, we have to take ownership of that each and every day. So, uh, I stand by this a hundred percent. This is a process. Yeah, and, and and I think as well, just to go back to the gaming really quickly, the gaming don't discount that from a, a leadership and a team playing. And because I do, I seem to remember reading a paper about five or six years ago where it was in the states and they were looking at uh, exec leadership teams getting them together actually on World of Warcraft because there were so many different roles that each individual had to play and the team could only work if they had a healer, if they had this. And so it was quite interesting to run these leadership teams through, through yeah. those gaming scenarios. But uh, yeah. What, what what sports does he play, by the way? He plays uh, basketball is now his, his, his game. He, yeah. Baseball and football. But right now it's looking like that basketball is going to be the game that he's going to gravitate to. Uh, playing year round, so we're, we we he stepped down from baseball this year yeah. to give himself a break, and it was football and basketball. But football got canceled uh, just because of COVID. They decided to go the season for for popcorn or football. But they are they are playing travel basketball. So he's on a travel oh, nice. basketball team right now that that this league will end in October, and then he'll have another one that'll start in. Practice will start in November, and they'll start the games right before Christmas, and then I'll go into the uh, March time frame. Yeah, it's so funny. I, I spent six months in the U.S. teaching basketball to to kids because uh, I played a lot um, in school and in, and in college. But playing basketball in the U.K. is very different. And when I started trying to teach some of these, you know, ten year old kids, they could just one on one school me all day long. Oh yeah, so. yeah. Some of these kids, I got, I know some kids my son's age. They, uh, it's, it's, some of them can dunk the basketball at this yeah. point. They're, 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 they're like, they're, they're far taller than me, thirteen, and they're taller than me. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, so the last question I wanted to ask you was, um, we've got a number of people who listen to this show who are expectant parents or their new parents and i always like to ask what is the best piece of parenting advice you could give i would say that the best parenting advice that you can give is learn to relate and understand your children just because they're children doesn't mean that they want to feel related to and understood like an adult yeah and too many times we're telling children at whatever age how when or why to do it you instead of like use questions, empower them to answer, you know, something that gives them that, you know, that power to make a decision to to look at something and do it for themselves. And when when children feel related to and understood, I think subconsciously it'll end up working to your favor where they'll end up doing really what you wanted them to do versus yeah. what you didn't want them to do. So it's like telling your kid, well, I don't want you riding out in the front yard. It's too dangerous, too many cars. And what what happens when you're not around? He's out there riding the bike. So you're not going to stop that, you know. Yeah. But, but I think if you, it's kind of like reverse psychology. You're not doing it for those reasons, but you're you, you ask more questions and empower them to do kind of answer, include them in the conversation, make them feel like that. You know, mom and dad understand me. Yeah, that is so empowering. That is so such an interdependent behavior. And that will have a dramatic impact on their self-esteem and confidence in a positive way. I'm not saying it's perfect by any means in a perfect world, but definitely more of, you know, it work to their to their favor and their development, of course, as you as a parent as well. 
Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic. And it, it, it slightly reminds me of a, a, a guy I talked to, uh, Michael Ray, who when I asked him the question and he was saying a similar thing, he said um, that when his daughter says to him that she wants to do something or can she do something? And instead of saying no, if that's where he's going, he'll say, now I'm thinking no, but convince me why it should be yes. And they'll have a conversation about that. And I thought, that, and, you know, from a very young age, and I thought that's quite nice. That's quite nice. Um, look, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. You. And we will make sure to link to uh, the Empowering uh, Fathers in Action uh, movement and anything that we can do to be a part of that movement with you. Absolutely be a pleasure. Absolutely. Well, I just want to say, Dan, thank you for having me on your podcast today. It was a pleasure to share uh, insights that could help your audience. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.